I want to talk tonight about um, the models that are being used to predict the severity of uh, the spread and mortality associated with COVID-19. Um, and I think that there was a, a really good article today in the New York Times, which I would encourage everyone to go and look at and play with. So um, because Instagram does not allow you to link to things, I'm just going to tell you, if you go into Google and you type in New York Times, Christoph, K-R-I-S-T-O-F, Trump wants to, you'll get this. Uh, otherwise, just type in the title of the article. Um, but in the article, which um, is written by Nicholas Christoph and others, um, they present a model uh, that they allow you, the reader, to manipulate. Um, now, you have to go to the bottom of the article to, to get to do the fun stuff. But here are the variables. You have the population. You can pick U.S. or world. Um, for the purpose of my analysis, I just limit it to the U.S. to keep it easy. You have the length of the intervention. So um, how long do uh, we enact social distancing? We have the um, aggressiveness of it. So is it sort of, you know, modest versus, uh, you know, you know, everything is shut down. We have the impact of warm weather. So, um, you know, is it uh, is this a virus that's going to go away in the heat? Um, versus one that is primarily uh, going to have not much variation based on temperature. When did we start the practice of social distancing or intervention? What is the infectiousness of it? So for each person who has an infection, how many people on average will they go on to infect? This is the r not that we've spoken about a lot. Um, what percentage of the patients go on to require hospitalization? That is patients who are infected. And ultimately, what is the mortality rate? And as you see, by tweaking these things, you can tweak the output of this model. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see what I'm doing here and therefore get a sense of how these variables impact the model. And a very great physicist once said, all models are incorrect, some are useful. What does that mean? It means that there's not a chance in hell you, me, or anybody else is going to plug in the correct numbers to this model and get the answer. Rather, a model like this could be useful if it allows you to play my favorite game, which is called the what if game or the what you have to believe game. So to play this game, you want to head over to your handy dandy Excel spreadsheet or any place that you would keep track of such data. And you want to start running through some of the scenarios. So I run through a base case scenario to start. So the base case scenario says we're going to take 14 days of social distancing and it will be enforced at a moderate level, which is effectively what we've done. It says that the impact of warm weather is sort of meh, maybe a little bit um, more than the flu. We start this intervention on March 13th. And we have an R naught of 2.5. It's worth noting that most experts believe the R naught of this zero, that is to say the number of people that each infected person goes on to infect is somewhere between two or five. I find that to be a, an especially broad range. Um, but nevertheless, let's, let's take that as it is. 10% of people who get infected need to go to the hospital and one out of every 100 people infected dies. So if you plug those numbers in, which believe it or not are somewhat conservative, except on the intensity and duration of social distancing, you get staggering numbers that are almost impossible to fathom. That is to say in this calendar year, 143 million people will be infected. The peak of that will occur in late May with a total number of 42 million active cases. And the ultimate toll of this will be 1.4 million deaths. It's worth pointing out what I note at the bottom here, which is that over the past decade, influenza um, in the United States has uh, afflicted somewhere between 25 and 45 million with somewhere between 25,000 and 60,000 succumbing to the disease. Let's now start modifying variables. So case two, and I try to highlight in red as you go from left to right, what I'm changing. So what I change going from case one to case two is I lower the R naught. So instead of each infected person being able to give the infection to two and a half people on average, what if we just lowered it to 2.2? Would that have an effect, all things equal? Well, the answer is it would have a staggering effect. The number of total infections would go down from 143 million to 35 million 
And most importantly, the total fatality goes from 1.4 million to 333,000, which to be sure is still a staggering number in excess of even the worst influenza year we've seen in decades. What if we do the reverse? Instead of going down 10% on the r naught, we go up 10% on the r naught from 2.5 up to 2.8. Now the number of cases goes up from 143 million to 178 million, and the number of deaths goes from 1.4 to 1.8 million. I don't think you need to be a mathematician to appreciate that the 10% increase did not have as much of a negative impact as the 10% decrease did. So this is not normally distributed, therefore there's an asymmetry to this analysis. If we continue marching along this, and for the sake of time, I will not walk you through every one of my scenarios. Instead, by pointing the camera at them, I trust that everybody can look at them, and more importantly, go and do it yourself. Go and play with the model. You don't have to put a spreadsheet together. You can just start to tweak the model. What you start to realize is not all variables are created equal. Not everything seems to drive the way this model goes from being completely out of control to completely manageable, I'll call out case five, for example. Case five, in which, keep in mind, I have not altered the um, hospita hospitalization rate or death rate. Both of these are still 10 times higher than that of influenza. But what we've done is put in aggressive measures on social distancing and put them in place for 60 days which is about four times longer than what is being proposed, but I've kept the r naught at that staggering 2.8. So now you're comparing basically case two to case five, and that takes the total number of cases from 100 and call it 80 million down to 15 million, and the mortality goes from 1.8 million to about 75,000 people, which actually is in line with a very bad influenza season. So what did it take to do that? or asked another way, what would you have to believe is true for that to be case? Uh, for that to be the case? Well, you'd have to believe that you can somehow manage to enact aggressive social distancing um, to the tune of two months. Well, if you don't want to do that, but you still want to have that type of a mortality, what do you have to believe is true? Well, then you turn to case six. What you have to believe is true is that the r naught is far less than we think, or is at the very bottom of the range. So now, if you put aggressive measures of social distancing in, but only keep them in place for 14 days, what is being proposed, at the same degrees of hospitalization and mortality, but you lower that r naught to two, so each infected person can only get two more sick, lo and behold, 16,000 people die. This is not even a rounding error relative to influenza. This has been a whole lot of nothing. You get the point. The point here is nothing changes the output of this model more than r naught. And we don't know what r naught is. In fact, I didn't even show you extreme values. In fact, I never went above three and I never went below two. Influenza, by the way, sits at about 1.3 to 1.5. So if I were czar for a day, I would have a task force whose sole purpose in life was to test as many asymptomatic people as possible and do as much epidemiologic tracking as possible to make sure we had a true sense of what the r naught is. Because my intuition is there are two r naughts. There's an r naught for symptomatic people and an r naught for asymptomatic people. And if we want to model this correctly, we have to model them separately. So not only do we need to understand how many people are infected who don't go on to require hospitalization, we also have to understand how effectively those people transmit the virus. And without going into it, I think there are biological reasons to suggest that symptomatic and asymptomatic people might transmit the virus differently. I'm not suggesting asymptomatic people don't transmit. They clearly do. The question is to what extent. If it turns out that asymptomatic and symptomatic people both transmit in the neighborhood of 2.3, 2.4, 2.5 are um, not, we could have a problem on our hands. Um, so with that said, um, I hope that over time, more and more data come in, we have a better sense of what this looks like. But what I would encourage all of you to do is go play with this article and start to get a sense for what these numbers mean. Because when you know what these numbers mean, you now know what to pay attention to in the news and in the scientific literature.